So my talk today is part 11 of our 2024 series, which is called Giant Steps. The goal of this is that in this year, we would all get unstuck from things that we've been struggling with or dealing with maybe for a long time, and that we would all step into the amazing promise that Jesus gave when he said, I have come, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, this overflowing life, this abundant life rich, God-blessed life, a life where you are living the dream that God placed in you when he made you, where you are truly loving, tender-hearted, peaceful in heart, richly blessed, and highly favored. This abundant life is the birthright of every child of God. If you're saved, I'm talking about you, this abundant life is for you. Because once you're saved, once you receive Jesus, the doorway to that life is opened, open for good. But for most of us, and I'm including myself here, we still find obstacles blocking the way. And one of the biggest obstacles is something that we talked about last week, and I want to get everybody caught up. And um, so last week, we had you pick up this slip of paper called Labels of Doom and Gloom, and I hope you brought it back. If you didn't bring it back, you could have picked one up on the way in. And so you need that. If you have it, grab it, and also uh, a pencil. Yeah, these are God's pencils, so be sure to give it back. Hey, Matt, grab ushers to come through. If you don't have, if you don't have one of these slips, we're going to have the ushers come through in a minute and get one, because you're going to want one, because all life long, as we grow, we gather labels, right? You're stupid, you're ugly, you're fat, you're skinny, you're short, you're tall, broken, wrong color, wrong language, wrong speech, you sound funny, you look different, you're defective, you're a reject, outsider, addict, red pill, black pill, incel, weird, ugly, you don't fit in, you're messed up, and on and on and on. And we talk about these labels. So I'm going to put some on the screen. These are, this is from last week's message. So if you don't have a slip right now, um, one of these, can you just wave down one of these ushers as they come through? They'll help you out. Make sure you get one. I'd like every single person here to have one. So where do they come from? These labels come from bullies, from mean girls, from parents, teachers, bosses, teammates, people in power, people in authority, people not in authority. You might be a teacher in a classroom and your students disrespect you constantly. Uh, they, they spew out like a fire hose from most of media and most of social media. And all, ultimately, when you chase them back, all of these labels come from the source of the dark side, from the accuser of God's people, which is one of the Bible's titles for the devil, the accuser and the abuser of our souls, the devil. That's where these labels come from. And these are on the screen to kind of be suggestive to you of labels that you carry. And we began last week to write some down. So if you could write some down, um, if you haven't done that yet, or if you already have, hopefully you brought that back. And you could even add some more. The more, the better, because we're going to do something powerful um, with these labels in a little bit. These labels go deep. These labels affect your life. These labels affect predominantly two areas of your life. They affect your love and they affect your success. And they have a way of creating self-fulfilling prophecies because we will live up or down to the labels that we embrace about ourselves. And even if we do that um, not consciously, we all need rehab in these labels. I need rehab. We all need it. So I preached a whole sermon on this last time. That sermon is still there on our channel if you want to go back. Because writing down these labels, I know it can be uncomfortable. And I've got my labels. I've got mine written down here. I've got, been adding to it even today. Um, I know this can bring up some uncomfortable feelings, awkward feelings, even painful feelings. But listen, you guys, we all have a choice to make. We will either choose the discomfort of uh, surfacing our labels so we can bring them to Jesus, or we will choose the discomfort of burying these labels 
and actually having them run your life. Because these labels, when you shove them into darkness, they turn toxic, they double in strength, and they create painful, repeating patterns you can never figure out. You're like, why do I always do this? Why does this always happen? Well, the reason is there's something in you that maybe you're not even conscious of or refuse to be conscious of that's creating repeating painful patterns that are hard to figure out. And these are your labels. These are the negative uh, or the destructive or the inaccurate self-depictions that you carry. Repeating painful patterns that limit your success. Repeating painful patterns that injure your love. And if you don't bring these to light and if you don't bring them to Jesus, that's what, that's what you're choosing. If you're choosing to keep them in darkness, you're, like I said, you're either choosing, pick your discomfort, the discomfort of thinking about these things, writing them down and bringing them to Jesus, or the discomfort of burying these things and actually having them run your life in ways you don't understand and can never figure out. So there's your choice, and the only way to disarm these kind of labels is to surface them so we can confess them and bring them to Jesus, even the ones that are not your fault, most of them aren't, bring them to Jesus, which is something I want to help you do today. So that's kind of what we talked about last week. And as I go through this message, fill this out and just write down those labels. So I want to turn the corner and think with you about the next topic. So here's my talk for today. Step up to new labels in Christ. So who's ready for some label rehab, some grace rehab? Awesome, awesome. So let's get into the Word, and we're in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now, that's Romans. Go over one book, a few pages to 1 Corinthians, and chapter 12, verse 13, where we have a similar idea. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or uh, Gentiles, whether servants or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So the first thing you might notice about both of these places in the Bible is they both talk about baptism. And what I want to say right away is something very important about both of these places in the Bible. And that is that these verses are not dealing with being baptized in water at all. These verses are dealing with something else. They do not deal with water baptism. They deal with spiritual baptism. So we have the words... For by one spirit, we were all baptized. This is spirit baptism. And in the previous verse in Romans, it says, we were baptized into Christ Jesus. So these verses are not talking about getting baptized in water, getting dunked. They're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spiritual baptism. Now, don't get me wrong here. I believe in water baptism. We're going to have water baptisms next weekend. We do this all the time. We baptize hundreds of people a year here. And I'm going to, you know, I read an article that 43% of Southern Baptist churches had zero baptisms last year, which makes me sad. And that's just one denomination. It's pretty much all over the place. But we do baptize, and it's a celebration. It's a victory. We're going to celebrate water baptisms next week. And, in fact, today I'm... One of my topics, subtopics is I'm going to invite you to actually get baptized next week in water. I'm going to encourage you to do that, urge you to do that. The Bible teaches that in many, many different places. You can develop that teaching through the Bible. However, not in these verses we've looked at. Because what we do when we baptize in water is an outward symbol of a deeper kind of baptism. And that deeper kind of baptism is spiritual baptism. Spiritual baptism is what the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, did to you in that moment you were saved. I'm going to explain it, which is that when you got saved, you got baptized. 
And in that baptism, you did not get wet at all, unless you were crying, shedding some tears, which happens. The Holy Spirit baptized you into Christ. This, what this means is awesome. What this means is powerful. You're going to see that this has everything to do with your identity and with your labels. Because water baptism pictures spiritual baptism. When you get baptized in water, you get completely submerged in water, and then you get lifted out again. Water is a picture of spiritual baptism, and the way water baptism was designed by God is to portray to us what the Holy Spirit does to, does to you on the day that you're saved. Because when a person is saved, the Holy Spirit plunges you, so to speak, into Christ and specifically into his death and resurrection. What does this mean? So these are the verses we started with. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So there you're plunged into his death. Therefore we were baptized Therefore, we, verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. So you're buried under the water, so to speak, into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We don't leave you under the water. You're welcome. <laughs> so imagine that the water represents a grave. It represents a place of death. You are buried with Jesus Christ through spiritual baptism into his death. And that's what's symbolized when we lay you back into the water and submerge you. You are submerged. You are plunged. You are completely immersed into the death of Christ. That means that his death counts for you. His death counts as your death. That means up in heaven, in the file drawers of heaven, they pull out a drawer and find your name and open your file. They drop in a death certificate. This death counts for you. This means that you're dead, which means you died to sin, you died to the requirements of God's laws, you died to the world, the flesh, the devil, you died to every single nasty label you wrote down on that list. Because the person those labels were stuck to died. You're gone. You are dead to those things. Those things are dead to you. And that death notice was not a death you have yet died. You're still alive, 99% of you. Not because you died, but because Christ died, and you've been united to his death. You've been joined to Jesus so that his death to every dark force is your death to every dark force, and that includes every dark label too. As far as God is concerned, when Jesus died on the cross, every one of those labels of doom and gloom, everything you've written down, the things you haven't written down, the things you're avoiding written, writing down, or the things you haven't thought of yet, Every one of those labels was shredded to bits in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross because of the enormous love he has for you there. Now, we said that water is like the grave, and in water baptism, you're buried. You're plunged into that grave. You'll also notice, as I've said, that we didn't just leave you in the water. We lift you out of the water. So... The verse says that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we will live our lives in newness of life. In fact, if we add the next verse, which is verse 5, it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So not only are you united to the death of Christ buried under the water. You're also united to the resurrection life of Christ and lifted up out of the water so that your whole life is new. You now walk and live in newness of life. Now, I've been talking about the baptism of the Spirit, spiritual baptism. So we're set up for a definition. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit in every single believer at the moment of salvation in which he places you in permanent union with Christ once for all and forever. Amen? That happened to you on the day you got saved. You don't feel it. You don't see it. You don't touch it. It's not accessible to our ordinary modes of sense perception. 
But God promises it, so it's true. And you can't undo this. You can't lose this. This is why being saved is such a big deal. For you, you think, well, it's just a short moment of prayer, of faith, of choosing Jesus, of saying yes to an offer and all of that. And it is that for you. But in the invisible realm, in the spiritual realm, that moment is extraordinarily powerful and big and actually quite complex because so many things are happening all at once. You cannot undo this thing. You cannot unravel this thing. You're, you can never lose your salvation just as you can never lose. You can never become unbaptized by the Holy Spirit. You're made one. You're united to Christ. You're super glued to him. It didn't happen gradually. It didn't happen a little bit at a time, like one day you get 10% of it and then, you know, it just keeps growing. No. It happens all at once perfectly. It's complete. It's instantaneous. It's done It's once for all and forever. The baptism of the Holy Spirit unites you with the death of Christ. That means his death counts as your death. And that also means that all your nasty old labels are shredded. That day when Jesus died on the cross, and there he is nailed to the cross, suffering, and he's going through all of that pain. He was, I mean, we talked about it on Good Friday. He was beaten bloody. He was scourged with a whip. He was flayed, opened up. It was brutal. Uh, Crucifixion is considered the most painful and barbaric form of torture ever invented. There's Jesus crucified, nailed to the cross, crown of thorns, beaten to an inch of his life. And throughout all of those pains, and it was excruciating, Still, the most painful thing that ever happened to Jesus had not yet happened. Because the most painful thing that happened to Jesus was not the physical pain. It was that moment when God shrouded the cross in darkness, though it was the middle of the day. And he poured out on Jesus Christ all the sin, all the darkness, all the pain, and all the labels of the world. He reached into you before you were born. And he collected all of the sins all of the evils, all the bad thoughts, all the mean thoughts. He also collected all the bad stuff that's happened to you that's not your fault, where you've been a victim, where you've been lived. All that stuff was lifted out of you, removed, gone, and transferred to Jesus on the cross. And then when that transfer was complete, and this moment was in darkness, the, the judgment of God fell from heaven and landed on Jesus all the wrath, all the condemnation, all the punishment, whatever hell, whatever... Um, punishment, all that stuff deserved, all that was dumped onto Jesus Christ on the cross. And that moment was the most painful moment Jesus ever felt. And that's when he started crying out in pain. Before that, he cried out some things, but it wasn't an outcry of pain. At that moment, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was in utter agony. And there was something there that happened that we can never explain. Human minds can never fathom. We can't penetrate this. This is a black box box mystery. We shouldn't try to penetrate it. But in that moment, there was something going on where the Father, my God, and the Spirit, my God, there was a forsaking of the Son. Why have you forsaken me? I don't understand what that is, but I know there was a judgment being poured out on the Son. And he died. That spiritual death. And in that moment, every Label that you've written down and haven't yet written down, and every label you'll get till the end of your days on earth, was paid in full and erased and shredded and broken up into a billion tiny bits and blown away as cosmic dust into nothingness forever. Those labels are gone because of the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. They're shredded and gone and erased. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? And then he, when that moment was done and the wrath of God was paid in full, he dismissed his, he pushed forth his head and said, Father, into your hands, I dismiss my spirit. And he died. And what this means, this is all pictured in that two-second moment when you're 
climb in a tank of water and get laid back in the water. The death of Christ now counts for you. And this is saying that any label that cannot stick to Jesus Christ can never stick to you. Hallelujah for that. Amen. Yeah, you can say amen. You know, you hold in an amen, it goes down and spreads your hips out. So don't do that. I mean, when you look at your list and just think of what's on there, and you realize that the person who carried those labels is dead. You. You died with Christ. But that's not all. You not only died with Christ, you were also raised to new life, lifted out of the water, lifted out of the grave. As a new person, a new creation in Christ, which means the follow-up to this is that the only labels that can stick to you are the same labels that stick to Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'll take that offer any day. And this is what makes the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a doctrine, doctrine, great word, it just means a teaching. This is why it's such a big deal. And I want to tell you, this is automatic. It's automatic at salvation. It happens to every person, every time someone is saved, anywhere, anytime, at that moment of your salvation, and I mean the first time, because salvation is permanent, it sticks the first time. At salvation, you are placed into permanent union with Christ. That means you have a whole new identity. That means you have a whole new set of labels to go with that new identity. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this teaching now leads to a follow-up teaching, which is the doctrine. So we have the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now there's a doctrine called the doctrine of union with Christ. Union with Christ. And it's a follow-up. I think the, that union with Christ is the, to me, it's the most beautiful aspect of the gospel. It's not only good news, it's the best news, it's the great news, it's, it's beautiful news. It's a truth so glorious, I hope and pray you never forget it. And I hope and pray that you have a chance to tell a thousand people about it over the rest of your years, the doctrine of union with Christ. What is that? Union with Christ is the glorious truth that you have been so powerfully joined to Christ that everything that is true of Jesus in his human nature before the Father has now become true of you. Now, there's a lot in there. I had to say uh, those words, everything that's true of Jesus in his human nature because Jesus has two natures. He is, has the, is, is God, the nature of God. He is human, the nature of human. So he's truly the God-man, but... You don't become God. Some of you should have written that down, a couple of you. I did not become God. Um, the, the, what's true of you is what's true of his human nature before the Father. It's now become true of you. So, imagine, so in your mind, fly up to heaven, go to the throne room of heaven, and picture God and Jesus. And I have no clue what any of that's going to look like, except for I know Jesus is still in that body of his, that glorified body. And just imagine, try to feel the love that is zapping back and forth between the Father and Jesus, between the Spirit and Jesus. Picture the absolute love. Picture the absolute adoration. Imagine the things that God would say to Jesus. I love you. You are perfect, glorious, eternal, awesome. You are my precious son. You are my child, my treasure, my joy. On and on. You're awesome. There's no one like you. Picture what God is saying to Jesus, and what I'm trying to tell you is that everything the Father in heaven would say to Jesus and say about Jesus is exactly what he is saying about you right now. And that is exactly what he will say to you face to face one day when you see him there in heaven. That's the message of the Father to you. Everything that's true of Jesus has become true of you. You've been so permanently joined to Christ. The Holy Spirit did this. A few drops of heavenly super glue and done. And when you're joined to Christ and placed into union with Christ, this does not obliterate your personality. The Eastern religions teach unity. We don't teach that. We teach union. 
This did not obliterate your personality. This did not turn you into some weird Christian clone. This did not turn you into a Christian zombie. This turns you into you, the best and truest you, with all the beauty and potential added. You now have the massive potential of a soul set free. You now have the massive potential of a soul completely activated. All the switches turned back on. Can you imagine what it would do to a person's psychology if the reality of your union with Christ were so deeply woven into your thinking and believing and emotional life that not one of the devil's accusations could ever stick to you? Not one of the devil's nasty labels could ever stick to you. All those labels slapped on you by bullies and and horrible people and mean girls or even People speaking innocently but just still saying something cruel they didn't even realize. Or stoned out parents or father or mother too busy climbing the corporate ladder. And none of those labels now stick. You are so joined to Christ that he is in you, you are in him. And what this means is that his status is your status. His powers are your powers. His privileges are your privileges. His glories are your glories. His throne is your throne. His treasures are your treasures. His possessions are your possessions. His destiny is your destiny. You could preach a whole sermon on every one of those things. Do you realize how rich you are? If you did on your good days, you wouldn't trade places with anybody. God wants you to know the things that have been freely given to you. And supreme among them are new labels and a new name. Bible scholars have a name for all of these things. If you were to list them out and just go dig in the Bible and just find all your status, your powers, your privileges and all that. All the treasures, all the possessions. And privileges and powers you have because you're in Christ. There's a name for that list. It is called your riches in Christ. The longer name is the riches of divine grace in Christ Jesus. You can just Google that and the list will come up. The riches of divine grace. So follow the logic here. We start with salvation. Salvation leads to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. These all happen Immediately, but this is a logical progression, not temporal. It's instantaneous, which leads to union with Christ, which now means you have your riches in Christ, all of which is then symbolized in water baptism. That's the only thing that comes later. And by the way, we want to make it easy for you, although maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should make it harder. I don't know. But I want to encourage you, the single most powerful thing you can do psychologically to embrace these these new labels for yourself and wash away the old labels is to get baptized in water. And we're doing it next week. And what we've designed for you today, right after the service, is a 30-minute fast class where we'll explain the logistics, how we do it. And I'm actually going to invite you to stick around after this service for 30 minutes for that purpose. And I'm planting a seed right now in your heart. Say, I'm saved. I'm getting baptized. Junior high and up. I'm saved. I'm getting baptized. Next week, I'm going to that thing. Now, I want to go deeper because here's a verse that you might not have noticed before. Because uh, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit was there. He made you born again. He, He helped you get saved. He baptized you into Christ, and all these other things followed in sequence. But he didn't leave you. He stayed. Why? Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Now, most of us would have finished that verse, and if you've been raised in the church or have a lot of Christian experience... We've been given the Spirit of God so that we might know the list of things we're supposed to do and obey in the fine print of the salvation contract. But that's not why the Holy Spirit stayed, according to this verse. The central thing is that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. There's your riches in Christ. Do you know those things? 
Are you familiar with them? Have you ever been taught them? If you've been in Pathway, you have been taught them. This is one of the things I major in. There's a story behind that. Because when I first started as a young pastor, I was 20 years old, so a couple years ago, um, I was teaching in Awana clubs. Those are clubs for kids. We had Awana clubs. This is Chicago, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We had high school uh, on Friday. And then I taught Sunday school classes for the kids. And I was just starting out, and there was this grizzled old veteran pastor there. His name, he was semi-retired. His name was Lance Latham. He was over 80 years old at the time. He still had steely blue eyes, a sharp mind, handshake like iron. Lance Latham was the founder of the very first Awana Clubs, which is now an international organization. He is one of my mentors. We all called him Doc. And I remember one day going up to him, I said, and we're in, we're in this church, we're in this older part of the church, uh, worn out rugs, and we're in the auditorium. They had a couple of Steinway Grands there. Piano was big there. I said, Doc, I'm teaching the kids in Sunday school every week and in Awana. What should I teach them? What should I focus on? And he didn't skip a beat. Doc said, teach them the riches in Christ. That was over 40 years ago. I've been doing that ever since. So how about we do a little of that right now? Should we? I love it when you beg. (laughs) You label yourself not worthy. He labels you qualified to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. You label yourself sinner. Christ says back, saint. You label yourself addict. Christ says back, redeemed, set free by the blood of the Lamb. You label yourself dirty. Christ says back, washed in the blood of the Lamb. You label yourself guilty. Christ says back, forgiven. You label yourself a fatherless child. God labels himself a father to the fatherless, and he makes you his child. You label yourself worthless. He labels you precious. You say, I'm hateful. He says, you're beloved. You label yourself victim. He says, "Uh uh-uh, victor. You label yourself incompetent. He labels you able to do all things. You label yourself fat, tall, skinny, short, blemished, ugly, broken. He labels you absolutely glorious. You label yourself lost and forgotten. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child? Neither will I forget you. Behold, I have engraved you in the palms of my hands. You label yourself a waste of a life. He labels you invincible as a soldier on a mission from heaven for the cross of Christ. What are your labels? What do you say about yourself? Do you know the things that have been freely given to you by God? Every day, every situation, every problem, every trial, every perplexity, every lack, in every situation, you can say, I am, I have, I can. How do you label yourself? I am, I am beloved, I am adopted, I am forgiven, I am justified, I am righteous, I am, ho- I'm trying to preach her, I thought I'd get an amen or two out of y'all, you're, you're, you're making me work so hard. I am holy, I am a saint, I am a witness, I am a new creation. How do you label your provision and riches in Christ? You can say, I have. Yeah, that's it. I have dominion. I have an advocate in heaven. I have an intercessor. I have an inheritance. I have a destiny. I have peace that passes understanding. I have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I have strength for each day. I have an ever-present help in time of need. I have power. I have comfort. I have strength. I have authority. I have victory. I have peace with God. I have a mansion in heaven. I have everlasting life. Do you know the things that have been freely given to you by God? How do you label your abilities and your competencies? I can. You can say, I can do all things through Christ. I can prosper. I can thrive. I can get over this thing. I can be in health. I can kick my addiction. I can resist my temptation. I can live victoriously. I can overcome sin. I can find a great partner for my marriage. I can pray with confidence. I can bask in the love of God. I can get over hating myself. I can love myself in a holy and righteous way. I can love as I have been loved. I can love God. I can love others. I can love the world for whom Christ died. I can forgive those who've wronged me. I can stand against those who rise against me. I can grow in grace. I can be content. I can do everything God calls me to be through Jesus Christ. I was at a men's uh, group in a church in Chicago uh, as a guest speaker at a men's retreat, and I didn't know, I was teaching on your riches in Christ, that was my topic, 
And I didn't know it, but in that group was the head professor of the Department of Christian Counseling at the seminary I'd gone to. So that was Trinity Seminary outside of Chicago. And he was in that men's group, and I was teaching. And his job as a professor and the head of the department was to teach and prepare leaders to be counselors and to be therapists in the community and in churches and all that. And I was teaching on the, the riches of grace in Christ Jesus. And he came to me after the teaching and he said, he introduced himself, he said, Bill, if the Christians in our churches really understood what you were teaching, I'd be out of a job. Now listen, I'm all for counseling, I'm all for therapy. Uh, we have our own care coaches, we, have, we refer to counseling and therapy all the time. I believe in it, get all the help you can, don't be embarrassed to do that, don't be shy. But even so, if we can grasp who we really are in Christ, I'd love to put all of them out of work. And Christian love, I love you, I'm for you. And I want you to walk out of here today with just two labels, because we're going to keep going on this. So if someone comes to you and asks, how are you doing? This is what you say, two labels. I'm richly blessed and highly favored. <laughs> I'm richly blessed and highly favored. Practice. So, how you doing? I'm richly blessed Hey, classic service, how you doing? And there you go. Now, we've got these labels, and I said we we're going to do something, and we're going to do that right now because we kind of did things out of order. We saved time at this part of our service for this because we're going to go back into time of worship, and during that, we're going to do a couple things at once. First, I'm going to give you an opportunity to destroy these labels in a very satisfying way. So we've got some guys to bring our equipment out here. And I told you several times in this message that when Jesus died on the cross, you guys can do that? Take your time, though. Okay. Um, we've got shredders. So it said that Jesus, uh, all these labels were shredded to bits and made into dust and blown away into cosmic foreverness. So we're going to invite you to come on here and, um, oh, that's all I got. So I, I think I'll leave that verse up. We're going to invite you, music's going to start, we're going to sing some more. We've got two songs, there's plenty of time here, so don't, don't worry about that. And actually we've got some more time even than two songs. But we're going to go back to the time of music, and you are invited to get up from where you're sitting and come here and run those nasty labels through the shutter with a thank you, Jesus, amen, or a hallelujah, or whatever you want to say, or nothing, just or be silent, this is whatever. Because this is a symbol of what Jesus did when he died on the cross. And along with that, we are going to have a group of our prayer team, they'll be over in the corners if you're like prayer over any of these things, because some of you, these labels have been so powerful, you really need a breakthrough. You really need to break the stronghold. You really need to break the power of the dark side in your life. And they can not only pray for you, but we can anoint you with oil, as Scripture says, that the elders and pastors of the church can anoint you with oil where you really feel stuck. So we've got the shredding. We've got prayer. We've got worship. We're going to be doing this all at once. So I'm going to invite our worship team to come out. And I'm going to invite all of us to stand up right now so that way people can get out, out without climbing over you and all of that. Because we're going to go back into a time of singing. And um, you're going to see our, our prayer team uh, over in the corners and pastors too there and elders there to pray and anoint you with oil. Because some of you have been, you might have been carrying a struggle, a problem, a label. Can you guys step back a little bit? Um, for decades, and it's really got you down. It's really got you messed up. Um, this is your time. Don't let pride hold you back. Don't let bashfulness hold you back. I love introverts. I am one of you. Don't let that hold you back. This is your time to be free. This is the time to step out of those old labels and to set yourself up to, set into, to step into these um, 
these new labels. Uh, Todd, no, Josh. Yeah, move them out. Move these guys out to the, cor to the corners. Oh, thank you. Um, you guys. Yeah, prayer team's in the corners. All the way in the corners. Todd, so Todd Skinner reminded me that if you want to sign up for baptism next week, this is another thing. If you're saved and you're a junior high and up, Todd's going to be in that corner over there. Just go say, hey, man, I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to get baptized. Okay. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would just do something strong and beautiful in everybody's heart here today. Touch us. Speak to us. Overcome the dark side. Overcome the hesitancy. Overcome the fear. Overcome the inhibition. Overcome the arrogance. And just, just let us meet with you and do something special. Touch our hearts and lives, we pray now. In Jesus' precious name, everybody can say amen.